We have a tradition of kicking this event off with some project updates from around the observability world, uh, the CNCF observability world. And so we're going to do just that with our CNCF project updates. First off, let's welcome um, Bartek to talk about Prometheus. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Bartek Potka, and I work at Google, and I'm also a Prometheus maintainer. And I'm super happy um, to be here and within those first few minutes explain what's new in the Prometheus uh, project. And there is a lot of things to cover because we are, after seven years, we are releasing a new ver major version of Prometheus 3.0. And many things improved, but the first thing you would notice when in installing Prometheus 3.0 is a new refresh UI. It's faster, more responsive, looks, feels, and feels more modern and also has a new features. And the new features are around PromQL tree view, query explanation, and um, metric and label explorer, all to make it easy for you to access and explore and understand your metrics and also queries. To power this UI, we also improved a, a specification for, the, for our protocol for metric streaming in Prometheus. It's called Remote Write. So Remote Write 2.0 um, comes with essentially more uh, capabilities around sending more richer data. So you can also send uh, along your samples, you can send metadata, um, you know, exemplars and histograms. But it's also all of this while being more reliable, especially around partial errors, as well as more efficient because uh, of our novel string interning mechanism. So you can enable more, but cost less. Now, if you are um, into open telemetry and you want to send open, tele open telemetry metrics into Prometheus server and use open telemetry format, you will be excited for those two changes. So Prometheus has ships now a better OTLP metric receiver that works much better nowadays with out of order support. And we recommend enabling out of order support in Prometheus. So because of the nature of OTLP pushes, it's very, very handy. We also give you an, a very best, best practices list of resource attributes to attach to your metrics, and every other verbose labels will be attributes, will be attached to the target info label that you can query and join later on during prom, uh, with PromQL. Now, if you know, if you'd be definitely excited if you want to use open telemetry semantic conventions, um, because in Prometheus 3.0, UTF-8 support is fully enabled on both storage and UI. So it allows you to really, you know, exactly the same format of your metric, exactly the same name and label names that was not previously possible. Um, to achieve this, you need to quote a special, um, you know, metric names if they have any character which was not previously supported, but it's pretty handy and, yeah, make sure keep that in mind. UTF-8 is generally also improving and very handy for those who no, don't use English uh, in their daily use. Um, and there are lots of breaking changes, small breaking changes that we introduced in the Prometheus 3.0, but I won't go through all of them now. Um, the point is that we improved and simplified Prometheus project uh, for your um, convenience and our convenience, and just be aware that there are small minor breaking changes that typical user wouldn't notice, but you, there is a full migration guide that we recommend you to follow and check if anything um, will catch you off guard. Um, now, we love numbers and metrics. So I did uh, some benchmark yesterday um, and compared essentially three versions of Prometheus, 2.0, you know, 2.18, and 3.0 now, um, just to check the progress on efficiency uh, for Prometheus project. And it, it looks incredible, right? So for memory usage, uh, you know, 2.0, the old version just oomed for my machine, for my kind of like uh, prom bench benchmarking framework we use. Um, and then we see much, much, much uh, amazing progress and up to like four, uh, more than four times less memory use for the recent version. And and really, like, it would be probably better if I have a bigger machine. Um, and then, you know, for CPU, we see similar improvements. So really, really kudos to the Prometheus community for achieving so much and, and, and really improving it over time uh, nonstop. And we have more ideas to try. 
in the future, if you want to join us uh, and contribute, we are still working on, on, on amazing features and things. Uh, we are improving our governance to make contribution easier. We, are, we want to be the best uh, open source open telemetry me metric backend. We are finally delivering a new version of open metrics because finally it's under Prometheus team ownership this year. And we are you know, innovating with native histograms. We are actually extending them to kind of replace classic histograms sooner and more and more and more. So if you like what you hear, join our sessions tomorrow and uh, on Thursday, uh, where you will be able to ask any questions you want to the maintainers and learn more um, in details. And also check our blog and our Slack channels. Thank you. All right. Next up, me. <clears throat> Convenient. So I've got just a couple of brief notes on open telemetry, um, talking about what we've been up to this year and what we're going to be talking about this week. So let's get through it. Um, first, you know, we announced earlier this year in um, Paris that we were going through the graduation process. That's still underway. We're, uh, but we've made a lot of great steps towards it. One, and I think this is probably really important for a lot of people, is that we completed an independent third-party security audit of sort of the core SDK, API, and collector. Um, we passed with pretty much flying colors. There was a couple of small uh, issues in the collector that we found. We've also um, started fuzzing, uh, adding fuzzing to the collector so that we can find new and novel bugs. We continue to try to stabilize a lot of the hotel surface area. Um, the collector is a big part of that. We've been working towards getting a 1.0 version of it um, still take a little more time. We've also been making a lot of effort around semantic conventions to stabilize those. So database semantic conventions, I believe, are now released candidate. <clears throat> uh, we stabilized HTTP earlier. So various things like that. Really, the, the focus of the project right now is definitely on stability um, while also expanding our support into kind of these new and existing domains. Mainframes being one of those, we have a really good uh, mainframe working group that's, or SIG, sorry, that's been doing a lot of great work getting the collector to run on various mainframes and also defining semantic conventions for mainframes. And our generative AI uh, semantic conventions continue to push forth. So we talked to last year about how profiling was going to kind of become our next big signal, and we're accelerating that through... Um, a couple things. One, Elastic has donated their system profiling agent to OpenTelemetry, and we're working to integrate that into the collector. We also have a few eBPF and no-code things um, that have been proposed for donation. So if you're familiar with Bela from Grafana, um, they're looking to donate that to OpenTelemetry. Um, there's also a Go compile time instrumentation from the team at Alibaba Cloud that's been proposed. So. I think one thing that, you know, what we're thinking about is moving towards, like, how can we consolidate a lot of this stuff? If you're familiar with eBPF, you know, running multiple eBPF agents at once can be a journey. So how can we sort of consolidate a lot of these things? We'd love to talk to people about it this week. And finally, um, this is launching a debate, I think, today or tomorrow, but we have partnered with the Linux Foundation education team to launch a certification program for open telemetry. So this had a ton of people across the community um, working on it. it, covers the API, the SDK, the collector, and the data model. And you can, you know, do the beta of this. We'll actually be scheduling for uh, full exams in 2025. There's a uh, training and certification office hours on Friday, if you'd like to uh, ask more about that. But the idea with this is we wanted to, to give people a way to kind of demonstrate their mastery of open telemetry um, from the API level all on down. And this certification, I think, is going to be a great way for that to happen. There's going to be more um, at our maintainer's track session, so be sure to check that out Wednesday. Uh, 325, and we're at the Solution Showcase with the Open Telemetry Observatory. It's near the Splunk booth. Um, it'll have this cool art. Come by and hang out, and uh, yeah. Next up will be Eduardo. Thank you. 
Good morning again. Let's put my timer. Okay, so right now we're going to talk about the updates on the Fluent project, specifically Fluent Bet. Um, as always a reminder, one of our visions and principles for the project is about performance, being neutral and fully integrable. And that's what drives all the roadmap in the project for all the telemetry pieces. And Fluentbit allows you to collect many sources of data with many destinations plus doing processing in the middle. And Fluentbit usually can be deployed in many ways, right? It can sit on the edge like a normal agent doing processing or in the middle as an aggregator or collector, allowing you to deploy this in different ways for different needs. And today we are announcing Fluentbit 3.2. Right? And this is one of the biggest uh, release that we got this year, in addition with three at the, at the beginning. And one of the biggest implementations that we have now is the support for blob files. What is blob? Blob is kind of a large binary data that you want to move out to a different place where the order of the files matters. Imagine, imagine that you have a big file, like a video, and you want to send that to a backend. Now we allow to do that because normally Fluentbit works in a streaming fashion, right? But with this new implementation of this new input plugin, you we can leverage this and our first destination supported for this is Azure Blob. So if you are an Azure Blob user, you can leverage and take advantage of this. Now where this comes from? From General Motors. We work with General Motors because they are deploying Fluentbit in their fleets of the new cars. Really smart cars where they are recording with ton of cameras, what's happening on the street, and those videos are being pushed to the cloud with Fluentbit. It was insane and really interesting project. So thanks to General Motors for that. And also working on optimizations, we implemented SIMD support in Fluentbit. As you know, one of the most expensive stuff when processing data is to encode JSON, right? Everybody can read it, but it's really expensive. So we implemented SIMD support, and now we reduce it at around 30% when encoding in JSON. We did also did some other benchmarks in, against Vector, OpenTelemetry, and FluentD to see how Fluentbit is working. And we got really good results where a median on standard division is always lower. And we're going to share more details in the maintenance track. So CPU here is, you know, less is better. And we have continued working on this type of optimizations. Now, from a memory usage perspective, this is always in a baseline. Of course, every project can be optimized to get different results, but this is kind of the defaults. We also got pretty, pretty low. And this is really good news because when you're deploying this on thousands, a thousand machines, right, resources matters. So, yeah. And from a configuration perspective, we implemented all the YAML support. This is the classic mode, but in YAML, which is a new one, allows you to have every type of section in one file if you want or include other YAML files. So now you can leverage all your tooling that you have around. From the open telemetry support, uh, we launched early this year a way to convert non-native open telemetry data into open telemetry native data so we can do all the conversions so if you are collecting syslog messages from a firewall you can package that as open telemetry data and that we do this with open telemetry envelope processor and in addition we ship the same functionality for metrics if you are for example collecting metrics from a prometheus endpoint or receiving stats d in fluentbit you can package that as open telemetry on otlp and also, same as I mentioned, mentioned uh, OpenTelemetry is implementing profiling. And profiling is a new signal, a new data schema type that is being implemented in the collector and also in Fluentbit as well. And today is available in experimental mode. And well, that's all the updates. So if you want to wear a really good t-shirt, like the new one that we ship on every new conference or grab a copy of the new book, please just stand by by the Fluent book. Thank you. Uh, next one, we're going to welcome Charlie. Thanks, Eduardo. Hello, everyone. I'm Charlie. Um, really happy to be here. Um, Going to be talking to you about Cortex today. Um, I am a software engineer at Apple, and I'm also a Cortex maintainer. So um, um, yeah, just really happy to be here. 
Um, so updates since March 2024, uh, we had two new releases and um, uh, 1.17 and 1.18. I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, some of the new uh, enhancements and features in each of those releases. Um, we also have 22 new contributors, so the project is healthy and um, more people are coming in um, all the time. We also have two new maintainers. One of them is me. <laughs> Um, and uh, 325 uh, PRs merged. Um, on the bottom is the graph of the PRs merged um, since March 2024 um, with a seven day moving average. So it's healthy, I think. Um, so what's new in 1.17? Uh, we started supporting OTLP um, ingestion natively. So you can just send OTLP um, directly to Cortex and then it'll start ingesting your metrics. Um, there's also a new strategy for token spread um, around the ingesters. This is kind of specific to Cortex, so if you don't know much about it, then this is kind of not really uh, that uh, informative. Um, and there's uh, query scheduling as well, um, so you can actually tell Cortex, hey, prioritize this query over others, and, and so you don't have this backlog of, of queries um, that are not being served in a um, timely manner. There's also a list rules API high availability. So if one of the rulers goes offline and you have something that's wanting to list the rules, it won't you know, cause an error. Um, so that's the new features in 1.17. In 1.18, uh, we allowed for filtering alerts um, in the API, query rejection, um, uh, store gateway token bucket limiter, and ingester metadata API limits. Um, there's there's a lot of detail that I'm glancing over because um, we're running on a tight schedule. So, um, and also, uh, I have um, a uh, Cortex maintainer session uh, in, on Thursday with my other uh, co-maintainer, Daniel. Um, so feel free to um, come by and, and learn more about it. Um, what's next is um, partition compactor. So um, ideally, you don't want to have a bottleneck on the compactor when it's doing this compaction. Um, so there's like uh, something new coming out with being able to um, make it more available or more efficient. Um, there's also a ruler HA, a remote write, uh, which you've learned uh, heard a little bit about earlier. Uh, there's some improvements on that, and then support for remote write 2.0. Um, also multi-level chunk cache, uh, which should improve the querying. Um, when it comes to using the store gateway. Um, and the Cortex maintainer booth, um, we're at 14A uh, in the mornings, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, this is the, uh, the map of the project pavilion, um, if you're not familiar with it. Um, and if you don't know how to get to the project pavilion, here's how to get there. <laughs> I didn't know how to get, I don't actually have not been there yet, so this may not be accurate. <laughs> um, this is our website. Feel free to check it out, uh, learn more. We also uh, have a Slack channel, uh, uh, hashtag Cortex, and we have an X account, uh, Cortex Metrics. And next is Jonah from Yeager. Morning, everyone. My name is Jonah Cowell. I work at Pessler Monitoring Company, and I'm here to give you a little update on Jaeger. If you haven't seen Jaeger in a while, uh, we've made a lot of improvements in the user interface because that's the main objective for Jaeger is visualizing traces. Uh, so we've improved kind of the usability, the look and feel of the UI. Some of the things that you'll notice as a user or for your users um, we've also added some new capabilities like visualizing critical paths so that you can understand what to optimize in your application. So sort of visual improvements in the UI for Jaeger. We've also added a flame graph visualization so you can visualize your traces as a flame graph versus a timeline. So a lot of kind of changes and new capabilities that have been uh, provided uh, by folks donating their time to the project. And of course, you can still drill into the details and understand what's happening in your traces. So a lot of things that the UI does specifically, um, being able to look at changes in paths within your application, a lot of things that are uh, core to the project itself, 
uh, that have been slightly enhanced. There's still more work to do on the front end, and we're always looking for front end engineers to contribute to the project uh, because it is an important part of it. We also uh, natively emit Prometheus metrics. We've made a lot of changes in Jaeger that I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but we have tight integration with Prometheus, and I'm going to talk about how this has gotten even tighter. But obviously, we can visualize uh, the red metrics, so the critical metrics about your application within Jaeger. And of course, you can visualize them in your own tooling through any Prometheus compatible uh, backend, basically. So this is the visualization uh, that we do in Jaeger uh, of those Prometheus metrics that are automatically emitted through open telemetry. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about a big new release. So although Prometheus is doing an exciting big new release, we're also doing a big new release. I'm happy to announce that uh, Jaeger version two is now generally available. We published it on Sunday, so it's uh, hot off the presses. And we've rebuilt the entire Jaeger backend around open telemetry. So this is a really big change, but it comes with a lot of benefits and makes things much easier for us as maintainers and for you as users, because it's all based on the same uh, general code base. So the idea is that the, the pipelines, everything that we do in Jaeger is essentially now uh, built around open telemetry. This is a project that we've been undertaking for a couple of years now and it's finally finished. Um, it also allows us to improve things that we didn't have before in Jaeger. So uh, new capabilities around sampling and a lot of new features that come with this on the backend side and on the ingestion pipeline, uh, which is one of the key areas uh, within Jaeger. Also some of the other uh, improvements since the last KubeCon, so over the last year, a bunch of other UI improvements, new backend support, uh, a lot of just things that we've been building uh, across the team. So the way that it looks now versus before is we used to have binaries for different parts of Jaeger. Now we basically have a, a collector, or sorry, we have an open telemetry customized distribution that can be set as different roles. So it's the same binary with a YAML file now where you can actually make it uh, assume these different components of the pipeline. So it makes things much easier. You can mix and match and decouple things uh, based on what your requirements are. And a lot of improvements in the way that we use Kafka and various other things thanks to open telemetry. Uh, we're almost done with the Helm chart and the Kubernetes operator. We have a great intern program uh, that's contributing code and helping us get these things done. So these are some of the things that are sort of still missing with Jaeger v2, but otherwise the project is good to go. Uh, after that, we're going to be working on ClickHouse support natively as one of the officially supported backends. And, uh, and then a few other UI things that, that we want to improve uh, within the project. So uh, this is a link to the maintainer session, which is uh, tomorrow afternoon with Pavel, who's in the audience. He's another maintainer and myself. So come see us. We also have a booth, although I didn't make a beautiful map. Uh, we're there in the morning as well. So pop by the pavilion to talk to Pavel and I. Uh, and we can answer your questions and show you all kinds of things about Jaeger. So uh, we have a, a Slack channel, a, an X account, and uh, definitely come and check out uh, all the new things going on with the project. And with that, thank you very much, and I will pass the torch off to Anna. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Anna. I'm a software engineer um, at Isovalent, um, working on observability projects uh, for networking and security powered by eBPF. And I'm going to do Cilium updates today. So under Cilium umbrella, there are really two main uh, observability projects, Hubble and Tetragon. Hubble is uh, run as part of um, Cilium CNI agent, uh, providing visibility, observability for networking, and Tetragon is kind of extending this functionality more in security context. Uh, so let's start with Hubble. So what's new in Hubble? Um, 
Hubble produces network flows as JSON events that um, are can be exported to a log file for further processing. And this functionality has been uh, extended a lot to allow uh, for dynamic exports. So you can configure um, filters uh, for some dedicated use case and export specific flows to a separate file. All of this without restarting Cilium agent. Uh, so you just load new configuration to um, um, to export specific flows to a specific file. Uh, there are um, more labor filters and also field masks uh, that allow you to configure what exactly you want to export to a file. Um, there are examples of Grafana dashboards that are using Hubble Prometheus metrics. Uh, a few of them, for example, a dashboard for uh, HTTP red metrics request error duration uh, are installable via Helm as a config map. And uh, we are looking for more examples. So if you do use Hubble metrics and build Grafana dashboards using them, then you are welcome to uh, share them with, with the community. Next, um, flow field reduction. Uh, this is feature that uh, many people have asked for. Uh, HTTP headers, for example, is something that you of, that often contains some something sensitive, some sensitive information, and users want to redact it. So now uh, it's possible uh, you can configure uh, what fields exactly um, will be uh, exposed in Hubble flows, and others can be redacted. In the example here, we, for example, um, allow only uh, trace parent headers. Uh, to be exported. Um, Hubble now supports a few new Cilium features, um, things like MTLS and Cilium Egress Gateway. So if you are using Cilium CNI with these features, then uh, you will be happy to uh, have visibility for them in Hubble. Uh, on the query side, uh, Flow queries now support uh, many new filters, things like uh, filtering by node, by cluster name, uh, a few other ones, and also cell. So uh, with cell queries, you can uh, query flows for uh, any exciting use cases that you might have. Uh, the example here uh, is cell query for um, flows where source namespace is different from destination namespace, so essentially cross namespace traffic in a cluster. Uh, and last but not least, um, network policy correlation. So one of the main use cases for Hubble is troubleshooting network policies in a Kubernetes cluster. What um, what we are often asked is like what policy uh, dropped a packet and uh, it's not an easy question to answer in complex cluster with many policies because uh, many policies uh, come together and um, the product on all of them um, affects what packets are allowed or dropped. So and the Hubble flows now uh, include this ingress allowed by and egress allowed by fields that tell you which policies, which network policies uh, are responsible for uh, this particular network flow. Uh, for more details about new Hubble features, check out the uh, Cilium 115 and 116 release blog post. And now let's move to Tetragon. So Tetragon is uh, a tool for um, security observability mainly, but really at its core, it's very generic tool that allows you to um, hook into um, EPF attachment points and get events about what's happening in the kernel with Kubernetes context. So uh, Tetragon is configured by low level uh, policy, uh, tracing policy, CRD, uh, where you define what uh, hook point you want to hook into, uh, what do you want to do with it. And there are a few interesting features like uh, you, you can uh, capture stack traces, both kernel and user stack traces that will be exported um, in JSON events produced by Tetragon for further processing and also um, summarized as Prometheus metrics. Um, writing these policies is kind of difficult because they are very low level, so uh, Tetragon projects um, makes um, 
um, provides a policy library available in Tetragon documentation, tetragon.io, and also many example policies in the GitHub repository. Um, we have a contrib fest, a Tetragon contrib fest, first ever on Thursday afternoon. So if you want to uh, contribute or learn more about Tetragon, feel free to join us. Uh, there is also a um, community meeting, um, monthly community meeting for Tetragon. Um, so you are welcome there. Um, yeah, and uh, here are some resources. So Stellium documentation includes Hubble uh, documentation too, uh, Tetragon documentation. We have uh, Cilium and eBPF Slack, so everything Cilium and eBPF related, this is a good place to be at. Uh, Cilium community meetings are happening weekly. Um, we also have a kiosk in a project pavilion, so we are here all week. Um, find us there. Thank you. And now the last of the project updates, uh, Bartek again. Thank you. I will try to be quick. Hello again. Uh, I'm also Thanos maintainer and will share a few updates from the Thanos team. Um, so Thanos improved remote write receiving capabilities, make it more reliable, faster, cheaper. For example, there's extra tenant feature that allows you to send in the same request multi-tenant metrics, and then you can split them and route them to the proper nodes you want. That configuration of routing is also easier with the new globe matching tenant placement strategy. So you can like super easily tell um, the system, Thanos receivers, where to put uh, your metrics. And then also there are lots of innovations innovations on serialization mechanism and, and um, technologies. So for example, internally, you can switch Thanos receivers to use remote write with cap and proto instead of protobuf, and that improved massively for large setups, memory and CPU consumption. So um, lots of innov innovations, and hopefully we can improve remote write protocol itself uh, with those things. Um, Thanos PromQL engine work goes very well. There are lots of compatibility things delivered, like statistics, annotations, tracking, and like generally PromQL compatibility. It's a drop-in replacement. Um, we also mentor in the Thanos team a lot, and we will mentor. Um, and for example, we have one project around compactor UI that tells you what are the planned and ongoing compaction happening in your system, as well as hedge requests. So ability to kind of like um, send retrieve metrics by sending multiple uh, requests to the different replicas and picking the fastest one. Um, and yeah, if we there is still lots to do in Thanos, uh, we are improving native histogram story around down sampling. We are trying to be uh, as much as possible compatible with the new things in Prometheus. Um, so yeah, join us to make that happen and and. Uh, Join the Prometheus team, uh, Thanos team, and um, it's nice. And, and as a bonus thing, uh, I wanted to kind of inspire you with amazing integrations that others are building with Thanos. For example, Philip, Thanos maintainer, with the Thanos, um, with the Shopify team, they delivered parquet storage for um, for the Thanos project. So um, it's not available in open source yet, but you know, it's an inspiration what's possible on integration points, but also what's, what's maybe coming in future to Thanos. So stay tuned. Um, yeah, if you want to learn more, join our Thanos maintenance session, or I will be here around or join our Slack channels. Thank you.